Okay. So, um, can you hear that? It's a washing machine. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, uh, so I obviously have to start talking about that. I have to spend most of the time talking about the transcendental deduction today, but I did want to write the table of categories up one more time and say maybe a couple things about it before we go on. So, I mean, because this table is really important. Kant uh, is constantly organizing everything according to this table. Sometimes he tells you he is, and sometimes he doesn't. Um, so you have to always have it in mind. So I'm going to write it again in the way that I usually write it, which is different from the way he does. Um, he writes it in that weird diamond shape. Whereas I just write it in this regular table shape. Right, so there's four headings, quantity, quantity, quality, relation, and modality. It's a little blurry, Professor. Oh, yes it is. Uh -huh. The fix that is there we go. All right. Um, So one of the things I didn't get to last time was trying to give some names to these three columns. Kant uh, calls attention to the fact that there are, right, because he says, this is one of the notes added in the B edition, he says uh, that the third moment is always a combination of the first with the second. So he's saying there is an order uh, in um, um, and there is uh, there's some sense in which these are all similar to each other. Um, but he doesn't say what the first or the second column are. Um, so I think one way to think about this is to look at those uh, three convertible transcendentals that he mentions in, second tw in section 12. Um, that's on B1. Thirteen, um, the three convertible transcendentals. He doesn't call them that, right? He just says there's another chapter in the philosophy of the ancients. I said that these are called the convertible transcendentals, and the convertible transcendentals are one through good. Now, <coughs> um. That doesn't maybe help that much until you, you see how Kant himself describes what these three convertible transcendentals are about farther down on the page. Um, so, um, or it's on B114. This is all on page 118 in Kemp Smith. In all knowledge of an object, there is unity of concept, which may be entitled qualitative unity. 
so far as we think by it, only the unity and the combination of the manifold of our knowledge. So, okay, that's not very helpful, but what he says next, I think, is kind of helpful. As, for example, the unity of the theme in a play, a speech, or a story. Secondly, there is truth in respect of its consequences. The greater the number of true consequences that follow from a given concept, the more criteria are there of its objective reality. This might be entitled the qualitative plurality of characters, which belong to a concept as to a common ground. And thirdly, and lastly, there is perfection, which consists in this, that the plurality together leads back to the unity of the concept and accords completely with this and with no other concept. Right, so th these these three moments are like this one. And so, and what Kant says about them is that they don't belong in the table of categories because they're subjective. They're subjective conditions for um, having a good concept. One is that that it's that it's really is all one um, thing that I'm thinking about. Another is that I'm thinking about it uh, as uh, having a number of different characteristics that marks it out as that one thing. And the third is that I'm thinking of those characteristics as somehow all adding up together back to this unity as their ground. Um, so uh, it's like, thinking of something as an immediate unity that just remains in itself um, and uh, just is what it is, that's the first one. Thinking of something as uh, a ground of consequences that flow out of it, that's the second one. And thirdly, thinking of it as um, um, what those consequences kind of like revert back to and add up to altogether. That's the third one. Um, another set of names you can use for this is, this is the ancient, neo. these are the ancient Neoplatonist names for these. Permanence, um, progression and reversion. Um, so I think when you go down through the table of categories and look at the moments of each one, you can see that these things kind of summarize what the relationship in the first, second, and third moment is. So like it's obviously, it's easiest in the case of quantity unity, plurality, totality. Um, and that's what Kant says, that the three convertible transcendentals are really just the categories of quantity, like, but applied subjectively or something like that. So, right, the, the representing the object as a unity, like I said, it's like representing all cinnabar as one thing. It's all the same, um, so to speak, like no matter how far you go with it, it's always the same. Whereas plurality is um, is focusing on how it like goes out of itself, is different from itself. Right? Every, how, however far you go with it, you always get more and more a different piece of cinnabars. Well, I guess I shouldn't say piece yet, but you get like a different part, a different location in this unity. And then totality is um, now, I mean, so totality would be if we could represent all the cinnabar that there possibly is all as one thing and add it all back up together, that would be, abs that would be representing cinnabar as an absolute totality. 
Kant is going to say we never do that with empirical objects. Re reasonably enough, even without getting into the argument why it's impossible, you can see we don't do that, right? We don't represent all cinnabar everywhere as one thing. It's always relative, but like up to some place where we've got to, by going through this plurality, we stop and add everything back up to that sameness that is cinnabar. And that's how we represent a single piece of cinnabar as a totality. Um, so, I mean, that's these first three. And also, this is what I said last time about the metaphysical deduction, how these follow from the um, universal, uh, from the, the need to be able to use cinnabar in universal judgments, particular judgments, and singular judgments. Right? We have to be able to represent cinnabar as all one everywhere in order to say something like all cinnabar is red. We have to represent, we have to be able to represent cinnabar as always different everywhere in order to say something like some cinnabar is shiny. Right? That says, you know, go up to a certain point in cinnabar and you'll find it shiny, and after that you won't. So it implies that you get to different places as you go through it, so to speak. And then when I say this cinnabar weighs five grams, I'm, then I'm assuming that I, I can represent cinnabar as a totality. Um, so I think that the other categories are also at least supposed to work out the same way somehow. So, right, like in this case, reality is, you know, that's when you kind of stay with Cinnabar and ask, what's its character that makes it what it is? That's its reality. Whereas when you think of Cinnabar as kind of, uh, um, qualitatively different, you're thinking about it as what it's not. And then um, when you kind of take all the things that it's not and add them up together, you get a um, uh, characterization of what it is in terms not of like um, an immediate self-identical character, but in terms of a limit that's drawn around. Now, I'm, see, I'm not talking about a spatial limit that's drawn around Cinnabar, right? But like a limit that's drawn around what Cinnabar is. Um, you get at what it is not by um, Kind of like staring right at it, so to speak, but by going all around the edge and ruling everything else out, that's the moment of limit. And again, this, just as we don't do this absolutely, we don't do this absolutely, we can't really take into account all the things that Cinnabar is not. It's always relative to some purpose, to some, um, you know, classification. We never have the absolute limit that tells us, that characterizes Cinnabar by ruling out everything that isn't Cinnabar. Um, so, I mean, I'm not going to go into the same detail through these other moments. I'm just going to say that I think if you think about them, they're, they're kind of similar. Right, substance accident is kind of, it's the relation to something, uh, it's a relation something has insofar as it just is what it is. Um, it's a relationship between what it is and it's uh, like current state or something like that. Whereas cause and effect is a relationship between something as what it is and its consequences that are different from it. And this, mo this moment of community is supposed to, again, be like somehow all these, uh, 
causes and effects, the way everything goes out of itself into something else, ends up uh, like, again, like if you could add up all the causes that make something different, um, they would all add up to, um, to, to what it is in its state right now. Um, and again, we can't do that absolutely. We always are only regarding something as part of a relative whole of other substances that interact with it. Um, now, well, I'll just write in the last three here. So this is possibility, existence, and necessity. And um, so Kant understands these three moments and will, he already said something about this when he was talking about the judgments, the corresponding judgments. He's going to say something like this about the categories that correspond to them uh, later on, which is that these categories don't tell you, they're not ways of thinking about the object itself. They're ways of thinking about the relationship between the object and the subject that rep that's representing it. So if I represent something as possible, I'm just kind of um, staying within my own faculty of representation and saying, I can represent it. That can mean different things depending on what kind of possibility I'm thinking about, but that's what it, it's just like, I'm only thinking about my ability to represent this object, whereas existence means that my ability to represent it corresponds to the object. So again, it's like um, the representation as pointing to something different from itself. To the extent that that works, I can say the object actually exists. It's not just possible. And then necessity means that um, as, as Kant says when he discusses this example, these three moments, he says, right, necessity means something, the existence of which follows merely from its possibility. That is, just from seeing my ability to represent it, I can tell that something must correspond to it. So it necessarily exists. And again, Kant is going to say, but we never do this absolutely with empirical objects. Right, so in this case, what it means is um, I never represent an empirical object as like, there must be this piece of cinnabar, it must exist. I always represent it as necessary only relative to some conditions. That is, I represent it as necessary relative to its cause or something like that. So I'd say like, given the way everything else is, and it's never everything else either. It's always like, given this context, this thing must exist. Um, but what that amounts to is not absolutely, but relatively me saying like, given the way I represent this in this context, something must correspond to my representation. I don't have to check to see that it's there. So, I mean, um, that's as much as I can say about this structure here, at least for the moment. Um, the structure here, so there's two things. Kant makes a distinction between these two, which he calls um, mathematical categories, and these two, which he calls dynamical categories. Um, and I guess I'll say more about that later when it comes up, but you should like, you'll notice as you go through that very often these two are treated differently than these two. And one sign of that is what something I already mentioned that often he'll just talk about the category of quantity and he won't mention the, its moments and the same for quality. Whereas when he gets to these two, he usually will go through all three. And we'll see in some sections coming up that it's like that um, for these, he'll prove three separate fundamental principles, whereas for these two, he'll only prove one fundamental principle. 
And he doesn't say why, but it seems to correspond to this distinction. So that's something to keep in mind. But the other thing is something I also just mentioned, namely that you could call these three, these three objective categories, right? These, these three categories are categories for thinking about what the object is, whereas this one is about the relationship between the subject. It's not really readable. The relationship between the subject and the object. So if you add on this line here, call this zero, it's kind of this one, two, three structure um, also exists in this direction where this is, you know, um, the purely subjective conditions for referring to an object. These are the three, so it's just like, like remains within the subject. These are the three that go out of the subject and are just focused on the object. And this is the one where the representation of the object kind of like reverts back on the subject and relates it back to the subject. Um, and why am I going through all this? Well, I mean, I think it is important, for instance, it's important to realize that there's an order, that there's a structure, that it's not just a random list of things. And um, moreover, that these like structural things with it often doesn't call attention to them. But as you go through the book, if you keep them in mind, oftentimes it's easier to see why one thing comes after another, um, why he's saying certain things. Um, okay, so I guess from the people who are here, are there questions about this before I go on? I didn't I didn't know if I'm chatting them over here. But. The, the only question I had real quick, everything, I understood what you were saying well to the best of my ability at this point. I just, uh, <laughs> I just can't uh, um, read quite properly and didn't hear them clearly. The other two uh, neo-platonic um, terms next next to permanence. Oh, progression and reversion. Progression and reversion. Thank you. Yeah. You could also use this. So there's also Hegelian names for these three moments. I don't have room to write it, but this could be called like the moment of immediacy, the moment of difference, and the moment of uh, um, I guess I would also say reversion for Hegel. But um, all right. Um, so with that, I'm going to erase the categories. But, you know, I think um, I've done this before. I should make a, a like a printed version of this table and put it up uh, so people can download it or look at it because it's really like it's it, to understand this book. You like you you almost have to memorize this table. It's it's like always going to be in the background of everything he's saying. And I mean, to a large extent, Kant's other books too. But for now, I'm going to erase it. It would be cool to have it in that format rather than just his diamond format uh, to download from Canvas if it was available. Yeah, I'll 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 put it up somehow. I don't know about Kansas, but yeah, I'll I'll send an email. Um. Okay. So now on to the transcendental deduction. Um. So remember what I said before about the metaphysical deduction. Um, I guess maybe I forget. I should do that thing where I say we are where we are in the book. That would be helpful. I have one quick question. Yes. 
but it is, it regards the assignment. When will the assignment due next Monday be posted? Well, this the instructions for the assignment are posted already. There's a link from the syllabus and also from my courses page. Um, here, let me start my browser and I can share. Oh, right. thank you very much. Yeah, because I went to the assignments page and then to your course page and I couldn't find the instructions. Maybe I didn't search too thoroughly. Okay, well, uh, let's see. And let's see, I have to stop the share and Oh, no, it's fine. I found it. All right. Yeah. So, you know, there's a link from here and there's a link on the syllabus. There's a link from here. But what I'm not sure is, did you look on Canvas and there's no assignment on Canvas? Uh, I went on Canvas and... The only assignment posted so far was the syllabus quiz. So yes, but I did go into your website and found the instructions for the paper. Okay, but I so I do have to make an assignment on Canvas. Uh, oh yeah, and I didn't do that. Okay, all right. So I will do that. You'll need that to hand it in. But the instructions, are, you don't need it for the instructions. All right, yes. thanks for calling that to my attention. Thank you very much too, for posting it. Uh, all right. Back to this. Right, so we finished the transcendental aesthetic. We're in the transcendental logic. And the logic has two parts, the analytic and the dialectic. And in the analytic, there's two parts, the analytic of concepts, the analytic of principles. Right, and down here is the dialectic. Um, and there's two parts of the analytic of concepts. And the first part is the metaphysical deduction. where the official name of this is the clue to the discovery of all pure concepts of the understanding, and then the transcendental deduction. So what I said last time was, or like this is one, two, three, four, two. all right. So what I said last time is that the metaphysical deduction, as I understand it, tries to show um, um, that experience must conform to the categories if our empirical consciousness is going to have an object. Well, maybe I didn't put it that way exactly last time, but the reason for that is that, as I did say last time, the categories are the like parts of our faculty or ability to form empirical concepts. And um, Kant says we can't represent an object uh, without an empirical intuition that is like a sensation that comes in at some time from some direction uh, and an empirical concept that is a rule which uh, we can check those sensations against to see if they conform to it or not. And if they do conform to it, then we have succeeded in representing an object, right? So the categories that I was saying are like, 
Kant says the it's that the analytic of concepts is the dissection of the understanding itself into its pieces. Um, that that part is basically what happens in the metaphysical deduction. The understanding is the like ability to form empirical concepts, which we need in order to represent objects, right? Whereas the ability to have empirical intuitions is what we talked about in the transcendental aesthetic. Um, but now we're talking about the ability to form empirical concepts. And we've said, well, it requires these 12 sub capabilities to do it basically. Like to represent something as the object of an empirical concept, I have to, for example, be able to represent it as one as many or as total. So, um, so what that means is that like, if there's any, if we have any empirical concept that, that succeeds in referring to an object, um, then it must be by virtue of using those 12 sub capabilities, that is the categories because we've just shown that those are the things that need to work in order to successfully represent something by an empirical concept. So that's why the way I just put it now is, if our empirical concept has an object, at, our empirical consciousness has an object at all, that is, if we can receive, succeed in representing anything as the object of an empirical concept, then the categories must, uh, um, that object must be an object that the categories can be used to represent. I mean, I'm putting that a little bit of a roundabout way. Like an easier way to put it would be to say the categories must represent that object, right? So like if I have any empirical concept that, that actually refers to anything like cinnabar or dog or whatever, then the object of that concept must be, for example, one, many, total. It must, you know, be something that is, it must have some reality. It must not be something that is, it must have some negation or it must be a, the object of negation and like so on through the table of categories. It must be a cause and effect. Um, uh, it must be possible, right? That is, I have to represent it as possible. If I, if I succeed in representing something as a dog, I must be representing at least a dog as possible, but also since it's an empirical concept, I must represent it as actual. That is, I mean, whether or not there's a dog right now, there must have been a dog when I acquired the concept because it's an empirical concept. So dogs must be actual and necessary. Well, again, it's not absolute necessity, but um, I must represent it as um, um, actual under certain conditions that make it force it to be actual, basically, is what that last one means. So, right, so I have to be able to use all the categories to represent the object of any empirical concept. So if any empirical concept has an object, that is, if I succeed in representing a world at all, then uh, the categories have an object. That is, the categories are objectively valid. They're objectively real. The categories succeed in referring to something. So like, I think all of that is shown in the metaphysical deduction. So what's left to be shown in the transcendental deduction? Well, you might say, um, okay, but who's to say that I succeed in representing a world? Who's to say that I have an empirical concept that, that succeeds in representing an object? So the transcendental deduction, I think is supposed to show that. It's supposed to show that um, there must be an object of experience. 
And then given what we showed in the metaphysical deduction, that object of experience must be the object of the categories. Which is why I think you'll notice as you go through the metaphysical deduction that the individual categories don't get mentioned really. Right, like the table, of the, the part of the analytic of concepts that talks about what the individual categories are is the metaphysical deduction. And then when we get to the analytic of principles, right away we'll be going through that list again and doing other stuff, explaining how exactly they refer to objects and so forth. But in the transcendental deduction, um, we're really looking at the other piece of it. We're saying, well, um, uh, okay, we know that if we can represent an object at all, it will be using these categories. Now we have to show that we can represent an object. So, um, so the transcendental deduction is supposed to show that there is an object. And again, remember that when I, when I say show that there is an object, like object means an object of representation. It's not a synonym for being or thing, right? Like it's not, I mean, of, of course, if there is an object of a representation that actually exists, then it is a being and it is a thing. Those are two of the categories, right? Existence and reality. Um, but um, but when I say that there is an object, I'm, I'm not saying that there is something rather than nothing. I'm saying that my representation succeeds in representing. And an object of what? And as I said, well, it's an object of of an empirical concept. Which empirical concept? Well, you know, um, in one sense, the answer is, uh -oh, is that going out of focus? Why does this happen? So in one sense, the answer is, it doesn't matter any empirical, any, any empirical concept, right? We're just showing that there must be some empirical concept that has an object. But in fact, in, in, a, in a way, we can say which empirical concept it is that has an object, namely, it's the concept of myself as an empirical thing the object of inner sense. That's what we're gonna show. We're gonna show that that concept must succeed in referring to something. So the transcendental deduction is really like it's Kant's version of Descartes' cogito argument. Um, it's uh, just like Descartes, he starts off by proving that I exist and then going on from that to show that other things exist. Um, um, All right, that's all I'm gonna say about that for now though. It's, I mean, it's it's Kant's version of it, but it works, it turns out to work quite differently than Descartes' version of it. Um, I mean, it works like one way to see how different it is, is that in Descartes' version, you can somehow right away tell all kinds of stuff about me just from the cogito argument. What kind of thing am I? 
a thinking thing. That is a thing that wishes to, you know, to know more, that knows some things, doesn't know others. And like, there's a whole long list in the second meditation. Whereas um, uh, Kant is going to say uh, that this argument doesn't show any particular characteristics of me. All of those are empirical. I have to wait to see. All it shows is that some empirical concept appear applies to what is manifold in inner intuition. Um, so this object, you know, um, um, it's, as I said, it's going to turn out to be me, but it sort of speak doesn't matter that it's me. What we're really just trying to show is that I have I have some empirical concept that refers to something. Um, and in the A edition, Kant calls this object the transcendental object. Um, why call it the transcendental object? Well, it's the object that we are able to describe only using transcendental predicates, that is, using the categories. Um, oh no, what happened again? All right. Um, Right, and we can only describe it using the categories because, of course, all we're saying about it is that it's the object of some empirical concept, and therefore, based on what was shown in the metaphysical deduction, the categories must apply. So it's an object that we represent as having the properties that attach to any object of um, our empirical consciousness as such the transcendental properties. So that's why I call it the transcendental object. Um, in the B edition, Kant doesn't call it that. Um, I think because he came to feel that this was misleading, that it sounded like we were talking about some mysterious um, uh, some mysterious special kind of object as opposed to what, you know, a transcendental object. So it's better than other objects or something like that. Whereas what transcendental really was supposed to mean here is again, just that at this stage, we can only represent it using transcendental predicates because we don't know anything else about it. Everything else about it is empirical. So in the B edition, I think what he calls it is this object is nature in general. You'll see this on B165. That's after today's reading. Um, or uh, as he says on B163, he calls it natura materialiter spectata nature regarded materially, where again, matter here the the sense in which we're using matter is that the matter of a representation is like its subject matter, what it's about. So natura materialiter spectata, nature regarded materially means, nature regarded as object of my representation and nothing else, right? That is no uh, specifics of what nature is. Those are all empirical. So this really means the same thing as transcendental object, but I think he thought that this was less misleading. You understand that we're talking about, we're talking about the world basically, um, the object of empirical consciousness uh, it's, I mean, it's going to turn out eventually that that must include both my, uh, um, 
uh, inner experience and external like corporeal things. Uh, but um, at this stage, all we can say about it is that it's some kind of nature, it's some kind of world that is, it's something that's given in empirically and we have some concept of it. That's what the transcendental deduction is supposed to, is is showing exists. Okay, are there questions about this so far? I haven't said anything about how this is going to work. Just what it is he's trying to do. I'm good. <laughs> okay. So, um so there's two parts to the transcendental deduction, and um, I, and I've, uh, uh, I mean, they're not marked out with like section headings, but Kant does say something when he when he makes the transition from one to the other, and I've separated the reading according to that. So the um, the first part is the reading for today, which is through section 20. And the second part is the reading for next time, sections 21 to 26. You've gotten blurry again, Professor. Why is it happening so much today? It doesn't. Hmm. Oh, That's it's good. back now. That's good. All right. It must be just because I'm somehow this seems to be less stable than it usually is, and I don't know why. So why it's rattling like that. Oh, well. What can I do? Anyway, um so um the division of labor between these two things has something to do with um, bringing in the particular mode or species of our empirical intuition. So like in section 21, right after the end of today's reading, that says, In the above proposition, a beginning is made of a deduction of the pure concepts of understanding. And in this deduction, since the categories have their source in the understanding alone, independently of sensibility, I must abstract from the mode in which the manifold for an empirical intuition is given, and must direct attention solely to the unity which, in terms of the category and by means of the understanding, enters into the intuition. In what follows, it will be shown from the mode in which the empirical intuition is given in sensibility that its unity is no other than that which the category prescribes. Right, so what that means, and I think if you look at the text, you'll see that this is happening. In this part, he doesn't rely on any facts about the, the, the actual pure forms of our intuition, that is space and time. Whereas in the second part, um, he's somehow focusing on, uh, he stops abstracting from the fact that our form of pure intuition is space and time and brings that in. Um, I mean, It's pretty clear that he's doing that to me, both it's what he says in section 21 and it tracks what he actually does in the text. There's almost, there's practically no mention of space and time in all these sections, except there's an example of the concept of a line, right? So that brings in space, 
and he says, I must draw the line, which sounds like maybe he's focusing on time as the form of inner sense, but it's only that example. It's not used in the argument anywhere. Whereas here in the these sections coming up in next week's reading, he starts talking about, well, time basically, not space so much. Based on what I said, you can see why it's time that comes in first, right? Because the object that is going to be the specific object that's going to be shown exists as an object of inner sense. So it's going to be the form of inner sense that is time that is in the first place used in the deduction. Um, so like I said, it's pretty clear that he's doing this to me anyway. I know people have, uh, other people have considered this way of understanding it and rejected it because um, it's hard to understand why you would have to do this. So like if in this part you show that um, no matter what the specific form of our sensible intuition is, given that we have some sensible intuition, then like whatever we're trying to show in the transcendental deduction, according to me that nature in general exists um, or something like that. Anyway, if you show it here, without assuming anything about the particular form of sensible intuition, then what, what's left to be done after this, right? Because our particular form of sensible intuition is some example of what you were assuming here. And therefore, if you showed it for any sensible intuition here, it should follow automatically that it's true for our form of sensible intuition. So, I mean, I'll talk more about that next week, but I think, you know, the to understand what's going on here, you have to remember what I kept emphasizing before, namely, like, what a weird case of an example of a general concept or general type um, we're talking about when we talk about our form of sensible intuition, it's an example of a sensible intuition, but it's the only example that we um, can conceive of as possible. We don't know that any other example is so much as possible. So, um, um, So it's not really true that we can show anything about a, sen about a sensible intuition in general. A sensible intuition in general, cut, it, cut away from the particular example we know, is itself something we don't know to be possible. We don't know if we're showing something about anything at all when we talk about a sensible intuition in general. We only know, I guess this is the best way to put it. Like the reason our sensible intuition is the only example is we only know that sensible intuition is possible at all because we know that we have one. We know the possibility from the actuality. It's not like we know the possibility first and then we fill in, like we add some differentia to get from that general possibility to a specific case. It's that we know the specific case and that's the only way we know that the thing in general is possible. So that's why this whole argument here is not going to show anything until we fill in the details of the actual sensible intuition that we know we have. Um, this shows something, it's, it shows something analytic. It shows something about the concept of sensible intuition. If there is such a thing as a sensible intuition, but we only know there is such a thing as a sensible intuition because we have one and we have to fill in those details to actually, um, for the demonstration to actually show something rather than just being like playing with concepts or playing with words. Does that make any kind of sense to the like the two people who are here now? <laughs> 
um, I wish there were more people yeah. so I could. It does make sense. And I, I actually have to run shortly because of my regular Wednesday schedule, but it did make sense to me. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, understood. Yeah, I know like this, this is the last time I'm going to do this. So hopefully from now on, we'll be on a more regular, I mean, we will be on a more regular schedule and this will work out better. Okay. Anyway, thank you for coming for as much as you could. Um, all right. So, um, so those are the two, those are the two parts. And so obviously today I'm going to focus on this one, which is the reading for today. Um, So what we want to show today is, this is where he puts it, this is on B143, page 168, Kemp Smith. The manifold in a given intuition is necessarily subject to the categories. Necessarily subject to the category. Now, um, and again, this is in B one forty three. It's the end of section 20. This is the, actually the last sentence of today's reading because this is the conclusion that he proves in the first part of the transcendental deduction. Um, so uh, first of all, I should say something about this word manifold. Um, it's a little tricky. In German, um, so in a context where I might say something like, give me a red one, or give me a red thing, or give me something red. Um, so like, this this is like a dummy noun or pronoun, right? Like what I'm really saying is, give me a red. This I'm talking about in English. Give me a red, but you can't just have an adjective without something to modify. So I I use one of these words like one or thing, or something like that. So in German, you can leave this out and basically say like, give me a red. And you add, so like, you add the, the ending that the adjective would have if they were a noun following it. Like in this case, if they were a, no a neuter noun following it. And then you capitalize it because you're using it as a noun rather than an adjective. So um, when Kant says the manifold, the word he's using here um, that's being translated as manifold is, is Das Manisch um, That's an adjective being used in this way. This is an adjective ending. Um, so it's like saying, like, 
the manifold thing, the manifold one, or if you say something like the manifold in a given intuition, it's like saying, what is manifold? What is manifold in a given intuition? I mean, you can like in a context like this, you can almost get away with, or you can sort of get away with doing that in English. Although it's it sounds weird, like um, you can say something like the red in a given intuition, right? Which would mean like whatever is red in a given intuition. Um, you have to read the manifold in a given intuition as if it was like that. What is manifold? And like, what does manifold mean? I guess like manifold itself is kind of, it has a little bit of a uh, archaic sound in English, you know, but it's like, um, um, you know, if like I were to say something like, uh, your manifold kindness to me, right? It would mean like, uh, your kindness to me, which came out in more than one way, right? That which like uh, um, had more than just one kindness to it, so to speak. So the manifold in a given intuition means whatever in a given intuition is like um, um, more than just one way. <laughs> the respect in which a given intuition has more to it than just one. So to say the manifold in a given intuition is necessarily subject to the categories, it means like um, in, in, in whatever way a uh, given intuition gives me uh, things manifoldly, <laughs> right? Like, um, uh, in, in a way that's not just simple, but uh, contains more than one to it. Whatever way the given intuition does that will necessarily be subject to the categories. Um, what does it mean that it's subject to the categories? Well, it means that, again, it's subject to some empirical concept. That is, it's, it means that it conforms to some rule that I have in some rule that I form and I ask whether it conforms to it or not. That's what an empirical concept is. And again, the metaphysical deduction is supposed to have shown that the, every empirical concept works by using the categories, or rather that the categories are the pieces of what we do to have an empirical concept. So, um, so if what is manifold in a given intuition corresponds to any empirical concept at all, it must be subject to the categories. Um, Okay, so the fact that that last thing is what we mean is the like clue to, I think, the strategy of how the transcendental deduction is going to work. Um, the empirical concept is. Um, Um, 
It's a rule in the subject such that any object of it, that is, of the empirical concept, any object of this empirical concept must conform to that rule. So if I represent what is actually manifold in actual empirical intuition, that is in like the, the manifold uh, nature of the sensations that I have um, as all conforming to some rule, to some one rule, which that one rule is my concept, then by definition, that representation of it as all conforming to one rule is, um, is intellectual, that is, it's active, that is, it's my rule. It has to be a rule in the subject. Now, right, that is, it doesn't matter that in the object, there may be a rule according to which the manifold has to be that way. Um, right, that is, it doesn't matter that in the object, there may be, and in, in fact, in the end, we're gonna say there must be in the object, a rule according to which it affects me um, in the right way to conform to some my ru rule of mine, because I can't use the rule that's in the object to represent it. I have to use the rule that's in me to represent it. So, um, that's why Kant says, like, the representation of synthetic unity can never be borrowed. Oops, this is happening again. Can never be borrowed from the object. I can't use the object's own nature to represent it. I have to use my rule to represent it. It would be different, on the other hand, if we thought the object could borrow my rule, right? Like if we thought the object could um, um, become the thing it is by being an expression of my rule. There's nothing to rule that out, but that would be what Kant calls an intellectual intuition, right? That is, everything that makes the object what it is would follow from my representation of it. Then I wouldn't have to wait for it to affect me to know uh, exactly what it is. My representation would automatically hit exactly what the object is. So I would represent the object by way of its reality. That is, I would represent it as a thing as such, as I tried to explain before what ding on sich or thin and thing in itself means. Um, in that direction, it would work. But in the other direction, even those are the principle in the object that determines all the effects that it has. Um, I can't like take that principle and use it to represent the object because that principle is not in me, it's in the object. So um, I have to form my own rule and demand that the object correspond to my rule. And what that means is that this, I think this is what Kant means when he says that like unity um, or conjunction, putting, to get, putting the manifold together into one is 
the only thing that I can never receive from the object that I must supply myself. The, the object can, rep, can affect me in manifold ways, but the representation of all those manifold ways as aspects of a single thing, as following from a single rule, um, that singleness of the rule must be what I contribute to the representation. I can't get it from the object. Um, right, and so this is, yeah, you know, this Kant says this on B129 on page 151 in Kemp Smith. Um, the combination conjunctio, he gives the Latin. So, you know, so it's a little weird. If he says it's equivalent to conjunctio in Latin, it should probably be translated as conjunction. But Kemp Smith is translated as combination. There's reasons for that. Anyway, so the combination, parentheses, conjunctio of a manifold in general. And again, so of a manifold in general means of something that is manifold, of what is manifold in general. The combination conjunctio of, of something manifold in general can never come to us through the senses. That's, it can never come to us to the senses because Again, it's we by definition can't receive it passively. That's the thing that we have to supply. And what we're trying to show is that, and now you can see why it's hard to show this. We're trying to show that we must, we must succeed in doing that. That is, we have, there's at least one rule that I can supply and demand that the, what's manifold in my sensations correspond to that rule. There's at least one rule like that, that I can supply such that uh, it works. They do conform to it. But why, like, um, the sensations, the way they come in doesn't depend on me, it depends on the object. Um, how can I prove that they must correspond to some rule that I'm going to supply? That's what makes the transcendental deduction so difficult and seemingly impossible. How are we gonna get from one to the other? Um, so there's one other detail to fill in about how this is gonna happen. Um, and it involves what Kant calls synthesis. But maybe I should actually think about this. Well, I guess I should say what synthesis is. So, like, in order to compare what is manifold in my intuition, in order to compare, like, the manifold way I'm affected to a single rule, I have to first somehow, like, collect it together for comparison. Um, I have to 
Uh, I mean, what this really amounts to, we'll see more detail on in the upcoming section called the schematism. But uh, but for the time being, I can just say like, you know, if I want to know, does something correspond to my concept cinnabar? Um, I have to have a way of like first collecting all the relevant sensations and then seeing whether those sensations are the ones that would that that conform to the rule that is the concept cinnabar. So that like collection. Um, like production of the right sensations to make the comparison possible is what Kant calls synthesis. And he already said, although I didn't call attention to this, back in the previous section, the metaphysical deduction, that synthesis is a function of the, of the faculty calls the imagination. So this is on page B104, and it's page 112 in Kemp Smith. What must first be given with a view to the a priori knowledge of all objects is the manifold of pure intuition. Again, like the reason I keep emphasizing this is it's easy to think of the manifold as some weird kind of thing, the manifold. Right, like we know there's a part of a car engine called the manifold. So, of course, he's not talking about that, but he's talking about some weird thing, some kind of like, uh, uh, I sometimes imagine like a kind of rug made out of sensations woven together or something, and that's the manifold. But that's that's not, that's why I keep emphasizing that's not what it means. The manifold of intuition means what is manifold in intuition? Right, so um, what must first be given with a view to the a priori knowledge of all objects is the manifold of pure intuition, that is the respect in which pure intuition is manifold. The way in which space and time are manifold. The second factor involved is the synthesis of this manifold by means of the imagination. Right, the collecting together of what is manifold in the way things in space and time are manifold um, is the function of the faculty of imagination. And then he says, but even this does not yield knowledge or cognition. The concepts which give unity to this pure synthesis and which consists solely in the representation of this necessary synthetic unity furnish the third requisite for the knowledge of an object and they rest on the understanding. Right, so the idea here is that manifoldness is given in sense. That is, I have a capability to be affected in a manifold way what manifold way? Well, at different times and from different directions and different distances, right? That's my pure form of intuition. And on the other hand, I have a capability of representing that manifold as all one, as conforming to one rule. That's the understanding. And in between is this thing that's done by the imagination of like collecting together the manifold way I've affected I've been affected in order to compare it to the one rule. Um, however, in the first part of the transcendental deduction, Kant doesn't talk about the imagination. Why doesn't he talk about the imagination? He just talks about synthesis in the abstract. And I think the answer is that the imagination is the way we do this. And the imagination is fundamentally a faculty for collecting things together from different times. And so in the second part of the transcendental deduction where he like, brings in the fact that our form of pure internal sense is time, that's where he starts to talk about the imagination. In the first part, he's just saying, 
Well, look, so the question is whether what's manifold in the in in intuition can be successfully collected together in such a way that it can be successfully compared to some rule. But we don't know how it's manifold. And so we don't know, we can't say anything about what this collection looks like. It's only once we realize, oh, it's manifold because it comes at different times. I'm affected at different times. And now we realize, okay, this, so this collection has to do with representing something uh, intuitively, even though it's not presently affecting me. That's what the imagination does. Okay, so so for now we're not thinking about this. You can see why I thought maybe I should skip this that part. But but on the other hand, if you try to read this, you'll see like every other sentence is about synthesis. So I felt I felt like I had to say something about what synthesis is and why it's so mysterious. It's I mean this is like a key to all kinds of things in this book, starting with the aesthetic that. Things are mysterious, not because they're talking about a weird, uh, like, other kind of thing besides the object of experience, um, or a weird, like, um, uh, pure way of seeing things that doesn't involve actually seeing them, or something like that. It's the things are mis seem mysterious because he's abstracting from all the everything we know about what it's actually like. Right. So, like in this case, if you fill in that synthesis means that at the same time I'm affected by one thing, I remember through association being affected by other things. Um, now it's relatively easy to understand what we're talking about and why it's necessary to be able to do that in order to apply an empirical concept, right? I'm being affected by a red sensation right now or by something that causes a red sensation. I associate that with other properties of cinnabar that I've uh, experienced in the past, like its heaviness and its toxicity and whatever. And I remember them together with this red sensation. And then I say, okay, so if the rule holds, then not only the one I'm being affected by right now, but the other ones I associate with it also have to be there. And now I, I, I know how to tell whether I'm experiencing cinnabar or not. Right, so all of that, when you put it that way, it's not so mysterious. But in the first part of the transcendental deduction, it's mysterious because we're supposedly forgetting that time has anything to do with this. We don't know how it is that we're affected in manifold ways. So all we can say is that somehow we have to be able to put together different ways we're affected. And that's what the synthesis is. So again, so like, um, how are we going to show that this must be possible? Um, okay, I was going to say something about the meaning of deduction, but I think I should skip that. Um, So this is the way it works, as I understand. I'm going to write it down in different steps. Oops, did I just lose focus again? Oh, but I did. So, um, the first step is that if I'm a thinking being, I can, 
I can think the object of representation. Now, um, this is analytic, right? Like if I'm a thinking being, a thinking being is a being that can think an object. And here thinking means uh, like the way a, an intellect that needs a sensible intuition to refer to its object represents things that is through general concepts. So if I'm if I'm the kind of being that can do that, then I can form a general concept. Um, now, I mean, so far we're not saying whether this general concept that that I form actually represents anything. That is. Uh, all we're saying is that since I'm a thinking being, I can, I can suppose a rule and ask whether the way I'm affected corresponds to it or not. Um, now, Professor. Yes. Um, when I think of like general concepts, is it kind of like um, general ideas and what like John Locke talked about that? Like, is it kind of the same or not at all? Yeah, yeah, it's like Locke's abstract ideas. Okay, that um, helps, thank you. Yeah, and I mean, I think Locke agrees that abstract ideas, that in an abstract idea, uh, um, I have to collect the parts of it myself. Right, the, like- uh, Yeah. That's the one thing I can't borrow from the object, so to speak. Yeah. So, yeah, and so like these examples, like cinnabar or dog or gold, would be would be examples of abstract ideas according to Locke. Um, okay. So what I was going to say is this is analytic, um, and moreover, it's an analytic context of consequence of a premise that um, I haven't proved. So how can I prove that I'm a thinking being? And um, this is where I think it is similar to Descartes' cogito argument. Kant's not going to prove this. It's not something that you could prove from first principles, right? Like, if a if you could prove from first principles that I am a thinking being, that would mean that I that I necessarily exist. That you can prove um from some axioms that you most that that you must accept that i exist but it's not necessary that i exist i might not have existed right so obviously there's no proof like that so instead the way this works is that um um you can prove it to me and you can prove it to me because if I try to argue against it, I'm showing that it was true, right? Like arguing about something is something that a thinking being does. Disagreeing, asking for a proof is something that a thinking being does. Um, so, uh, um, so Kant is, innate, is entitled to assume this premise because uh, if it's not true, then I'm not disagreeing with it, <laughs> right? And it's similar to the Cogito argument. I mean, I think it's basically the same as the Cogito argument. You know, if uh, like, um, if Descartes says, look, I can prove to you that you exist. Um, again, it doesn't mean I can prove uh, in the way you can prove that two plus two equals four, that on that way he can prove to me that I exist because it's not necessary that I exist, but he can prove it to me in the sense that if I try to doubt it, I'm admitting 
the point at issue, right? If I say, well, I doubt whether I exist, Descartes will say, see, you couldn't doubt if you didn't exist. <laughs> and it's, it's basically the same with this. I, if I say, well, I'm not sure if I'm a thinking being, prove it to me, Kant, Kant will say, look, uh, what you just said was admitting that it's true. This is in one sense of the phrase, what's known as an ad, ad hominem argument, not ad hominem in the sense of like the logical fallacy of trying to disprove someone's position by like referring to their discreditable characteristics or something like that. But ad hominem in the sense of an argument that um, although you can't prove it, your opponent must accept So that so I think that's what it starts with. Yeah, so this means therefore I can bring things or I can bring um I guess I should say I can attempt to bring. what is manifold under a general concept. Right, or again, so as you put it, under an abstract idea. That is, I can form, uh, to say that I can think the object of representation means that I can form a general rule and ask whether um, uh, the way I'm being affected now conforms to that rule or not. So, um, whenever I think the object, oops, I'm almost out of time. I guess I'm gonna have to finish this in the next lecture. I guess I'll at least get, well, actually, maybe I should stop writing and it just say briefly how the rest of it's gonna go and then I'll fill it in in more detail the next lecture, which is tomorrow. <laughs> um, so, um, so the fact that I'm a thinking being means that I can form these general concepts, um, which uh, uh, um, to which a manifold of sensations may or may not conform. So that means that at any given time when I'm trying to use that representation, I'm thinking the thing that's now affecting me using that rule. I'm at the same time uh, um, I'm thinking what's affecting me now as one instance among many possible instances of being affected according to that rule. Right, that's what it means to say that it's a general rule to which more than one thing could conform, to which a manifold could conform. I'm thinking of um, if I'm if I'm thinking the object that's now affecting me as according to this rule, I'm thinking also that other possible objects could affect me in that way. This, this is the way Kant puts it in the note on B133, a representation which is to be thought of as common to different representations is regarded as belonging as to such as have in addition to it also something different, right? So I'm always thinking this uh, rule that I'm thinking as applying to this intuition could also occur with some other intuition. 
Um, so um, that's what Kant calls the analytic unity of apperception. Um, it means that um, uh, every state of a thinking being is regarded intrinsically as something that could be identical in some other state. I could have the very same concept in some other state. Um, but that presupposes that I, the subject, could be the same subject affected in some different way. Right, so in other words, the I that thinks this also possibly thinks the same thought another time. And that's what Kant calls the synthetic unity of apperception. And the difference is that now I'm turned around and I'm looking at myself and I'm saying, um, well, since this general representation could also have another object, that means I, the subject, could also be in another state. Now, I mean, in real life, this if we add in what we know about the form of our intuition, it means I, the subject, also have thought other things in the past and will think other things in the future, right? That I'm a permanent, uh, I have some permanent existence that isn't confined to just the present state. But again, we're abstracting from that here. So all I can say is, like, I represent myself as possibly the same under other circumstances. Um, I must be able to, I must succeed in representing myself as the same under other circumstances, or I couldn't think anything at all. That is, I couldn't um, represent something as um, both a rule according to which the current sensation, to which the current sensation conforms, and also a rule to which some other sensation can conform. I must be able to represent myself as a permanent thing that exists in more than one state, or else I couldn't ever form a representation of a, a general representation to, me, to which uh, more than one intuition could conform. And that is what's supposed to show that I have to be able to collect my the sensations of inner sense in such a way as to compare them to successfully to some concept which is going to be the empirical concept of myself. Whether Kant says whether I succeed in that or not any particular at any particular time depends on a lot of empirical circumstances. Obviously, I don't succeed when I'm asleep, you know, whatever. But that I must ultimately be able to do that is implied in every time that I think something. And again, I can't deny that I ever think something because to deny is an act of thought. Okay, that's the way I think it works. I've gone six minutes over. I'm very sorry about that. I'll try to say it in more detail next time. Um, thank you for showing up. Thank you for watching, those who watch this recording. And uh, I will see- Are you doing you office later. hours later? I'm doing office hours right now. I'm late for okay. office So <laughs> I need to switch out my laundry, but then I'll be right back. Is that all right? Uh, yes. No, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. See you then. Thank Bye. You. <laughs> uh, I'm going to start my office.